In this episode, I'm going to take an in-depth look at the Amazon Elastic Cloud Service, also known as EC2. Is the promise of on-demand computing up in the cloud under our control a reality, or is it a myth? I'm going to attempt to answer that question in this episode of an in-depth look. Those of you out there that have not been tracking the day-to-day -day developments of on-demand cloud computing might just be asking what exactly is Amazon EC2 service. Think of it as one part old Unix mainframe terminals where you would connect to it and pay for only the hours you use, and think of it as one part hosted services, only a little bit more abstracted. What does that mean? Basically, uh, Amazon, Google, and Microsoft, they all have their offerings. Google has their app engine, and Microsoft has whatever Microsoft's calling, calling now is essentially a copy of Amazon and Google services. You pay for what you use, and you pay for the bandwidth that you use. You can upload database files, web files, and you can even go to a full-blown actual server. They have different aspects, and the part that I'm going to be talking about is actually hosting an entire server. I decided to look at this like I needed to fire up a fast server for a client. So I went up and I created an Amazon Web Services account, and then I created a Windows 2003 instance. An instance is essentially an outline of a machine. Um, if it's medium CPU usage, if it's high CPU usage, if it's low CPU usage, if it needs lots of bandwidth, low bandwidth, lots of disk, no disk, things like that, then I can load an image into that instance and I can configure security policies and assign IP addresses and things like that. So I'll walk you through kind of how I did all of that so you can get a feel of what the management interface is from an Amazon Web Services perspective so you know what you'll have to deal with if you want to spin up a server. When you first log in for the to the Amazon EC2 service, you'll get a dashboard where you can create your first instance. These instances uh, are basically the basic outlines like I, like I explained and you can choose the image you want. So you can see here I have a lot of Fedora systems and a lot of Windows systems. They also support the Ubuntu server systems which makes a great Linux system. You can also set up your own custom images which obviously at this point I wouldn't have any. And then they also have community images where you can get pre-spun up images of different distributions. Here you'll find Linux or of Windows too. In fact, for the demonstration purposes, we can look through. You can see there's a lot of Linux options in here with pre-built, pre-configured with different stuff. But right here is also, it looks like, a Windows 2003 server um, available to the public. It's uh, There's lots of options here. I'm going to take the 64-bit one here. And you can enter a key. And this will be your private key that you'll use to access the system. Once you have your super secret key set up, you can also create a security group. And security groups are basically groups that have special firewall privileges assigned to them. So I'm going to create one for basic web server security. You know, it's going to allow things like HTTP and HTTPS in, and also remote desktop. The default security group just allows remote desktop, which is what this group is after you've just created your first instance. So I'll go ahead and create this one now, and then later on down the road, I'll create a group that just for my web server that I'm setting up. This is smart because this this out of the gate is going to let you get in and remotely log in to your new server, which obviously is kind of an important step. Here I'm typing the number of instances that I want, and I'm choosing what type it is. I'm just going to say large. I don't need the crazy amounts of RAM and process usage that I get with large and extra large. Uh, these extras here, I'm not really sure what they do at this point. I know that there's different zones you can put them in, but I'm just going to accept the defaults and move forward. Once your instance has started up, you'll have to give it an external IP address. So you can go in here, you can create a new IP address, and you associate it with your instance. I only have one server at this point, aka an instance, so I'm going to assign it to that one. Now my server has a public IP address, that, and that's my instance ID right there, that I can now access that server by name. If I go over to my server, I can see that that is correct, that is the right instance ID, it is in fact running, and if I scroll down below, I'll see the IP address that I have assigned to it. Obviously, the next thing you want to do is after you have an IP and all those kinds of things, or maybe even before, you want to change the default admin IP address that uh, Amazon's going to assign to it. You right-click on the device, and you change the default administrator password. Now this is where that key that I mentioned a little bit earlier comes in. You paste that key into this area, so you have to have had to save that key. You paste it in there, it will decrypt the password for you, give you the old password, and then you can log in, like through a remote desktop, or if it's a Linux box, through SSH, log in and change your password just like you typically would. Standard, you, standard way to change your password, because now it is your own server, and you can have your own password. 
Now that I've logged in and changed my admin password, let's take a look at the specs of this box. I can see it's a dual-core AMD Optron. It's got just a basic computer name that they've set. You can change it in here, of course, just like you would on a regular Windows box. I'm, I'm, now, I'm now operating this machine like it is a server in my data center. They have some pre-things set, like data ex execution has already been configured. This, because this was a community image, there are a few things that are not exactly the stock installation. But hey, look at that. 7.5 gigs of RAM, 3.04 gigahertz dual Optron processor. Not bad. Earlier I had talked about security groups and how you can use them to manage different firewall rights. Let's take a look at that now. Let's go ahead and create a web server security group where I'm basically going to just, it's pretty simple. I'm just going to create a group and then later on I'm going to go back through here and I'm going to say what rights in the firewall this group has associated to it. So now you can see I have two groups. I have the default group I created earlier which gives remote desktop access and now I have my new web server group. So I can go ahead and I can select that and I can edit that security group to do whatever I want to do for firewall rights. All right, now I'm in here managing my group. I've selected the web server group, and I'm going to add firewall rules. It's a pretty simple interface. They already have some predefined rules for, like, DNS, HTTP, the real common protocols, HTTPS, SQL services, remote desktop, SSH, all that really basic stuff. You can quickly bang through it and add what ports you need open. And on top of that, they've also built some intelligence in. If I add something twice, I'll get the error message saying, hey, you've already added this, stupid. What are you trying to do here? That's really helpful uh, if you're just trying to bang through this thing really quick and you get a little click happy. They actually have some smart error detection built in. All right, so there you have your lightning fast how to set up a server on the EC2 service. Now, what would you use this service for? Because if you want file storage, they've already got S3, and that's pretty fast, and it works great for basic file storage. If you want database storage, they've already got their, their database service, so what would you want that? Or why would you want this for that? You probably wouldn't. Where this fits in is if you need a complete server. Maybe you want an entire Linux box, or maybe you need an entire Windows server up there. This is probably where this steps in. Some great usage examples I could think of, hot standby server. A server off-site that you could fire up immediately and have it going. I didn't show you some of the things like you can do snapshots. So you could also do this as a test service, right? If you want to upload and make modifications to what would typically be a production system but you want to have it mirrored on EC2 for testing you want to update applications and see if anything breaks and if it does you could revert back to a snapshot that's pretty handy but I think even more so if you have maybe a mobile user setup where you have lots of users on the road they all need to connect to a service but they don't have to use it constantly this would also be a good this would also be a good use for that because you only pay for what you use and it's something like for the system I set up it's 14 cents per compute hour. So you can do the math on that, but basically for every hour that it's used, I'll get charged 14 cents. Or in this case, the client would get charged 14 cents. That's not bad. That's pretty cheap for a dual 3 gigahertz Optron with 7.5 gigs of RAM, and the upload and download speeds are crazy fast. I tested the upload and download speeds using just like generic speed test programs, and uh, I couldn't get anything less than 40 megabits up, and it usually ranged between 20 and 50 megabits down, depending on where I tested it. And if I needed additional storage, this does integrate with the S3 system, so I could use the Amazon S3 storage system, which if you don't know what that is, probably worth checking out. So in the end, do I know what I'll use this for? Not exactly yet, but I can already see that it's going to be useful. It's extremely powerful, it's extremely quick, and it's extremely easy. That's a lot of extreme. And on top of that, I've already got some ideas kicking around in my head. Example, uh, an all-Mac client. They uh, don't want to have, and they don't want to pay for the Windows Server, the infrastructure, and all that kinds of things. But they need a vendor application that runs on Windows. Set one of these up. Create the firewall, establish a VPN connection. Bob's your uncle. You've got an on-demand Windows system available for 14 cents an hour when you need it. You can even get slower systems with Linux that are about 10 cents an hour. The Windows systems do require, um, like, they have like a limit of you can't go below the high grade system, which is the dual Optron with 7.5 gigs of RAM. They have like pre-built images just for that configuration. So 14 cents versus 10 cents, there is some savings there depending on how much you're going to be using it. Um, and then also, as you saw in the uh, in the videos, if you're watching this in, in video, there is uh, a lot of options for different Linux systems, a lot of Ubuntu, Debian, CentOS, Fedora. So if you just need an Apache server with MySQL and things like that, this, this looks pretty powerful. And uh, like I said, the speeds are great. So that's my basic look at the uh, at the Amazon EC2 service. 
I think that does have a lot of potential. I think it is finally answering cloud computing, but cloud computing we have control over. I mean, this is definitely something in the cloud in a distributed data center that I never see a physical box, but I have complete control over it. Uh, that's actually pretty useful. I can really see. It seems like a, seems like a cross-grade grade between cloud computing and, uh, and hosted data center computing. I think it's actually pretty neat. Now this video just scratched the surface on Amazon EC2. There's a lot more to go into, obviously, and if you're listening to the audio version, uh, you might have missed a few details. So I'm going to link to some books you could read on EC2. They're actually pretty useful. I, uh, I will admit that if you buy them from the link, uh, I make a small percentage, like 4% or 6%. It doesn't cost you anything. It's actually kind of a neat way to donate to the show. Uh, if, if the Amazon products we link to, we have an affiliate program set up, and we just get a tiny, tiny bit, like 6% commission off that, but they don't raise the rates to you, so you get to buy what you want, we get a little cash, it's a win-win, but it's actually a pretty good way. If you're kind of analog, or if you want to really dive into this, if you think this might have some potential, I'll link to some books you could get that uh, will probably help you a lot better than this video would, but it is a good first look, and I think if you've been wondering what EC2 is all about, hopefully I've answered that question. Uh, I would like to remind everybody, we also have the promo code you can use use it godaddy.com they save you some cash they pay our bills it's a win-win if you use the code linux that's l-i-n-u-x when you check out you'll save 10 percent off any order we get a little credit from godaddy and everybody wins also i'd like to remind you that if you'd like to follow me on twitter that is twitter.com slash chris l-a-s and that's kind of where i just ramble about stuff I make posts about shows, and I make posts about what I'm thinking about. I make posts on my progress of different shows that I'm working on. So you can keep updated there if you're interested. Uh, maybe tell me what you think of the hat. huh? It's an Indiana Jones 4 hat, so don't hate too hard. I mean, it might not work here, but don't hate on the hat too hard. Otherwise, you're hating on Indiana. Actually, it's not Indiana Jones 4. It's just Indiana. You'd be hating on entire people's childhoods and probably one of the coolest movies, franchises ever. So, I mean, it's cool if you don't like the hat. No worries. Oh, <laughs> for those of you that uh, were following my progress with the PlayStation 3, I should have an episode out about that later this week. All right, everybody, thanks so much for tuning in to this episode of An In-Depth Look. Remember, you can find all of these shows at youtube.com slash jupiterbroadcasting and at jupiterbroadcasting.com where we have lots of feeds where you can get these things downloaded in iPod format or AUG video format or whatever kind of portable format you might want over at jupiterbroadcasting.com. And be sure to stay tuned for the next episode of In-Depth Look. Like I said, the PlayStation 3 is going to get Linux installed on it, and I'm going to talk about how that goes. This episode of An In-Depth Look was sponsored by GoDaddy.com. Starting at just $3.99 per month, Linux shared hosting from GoDaddy.com includes 99.9% .9 uptime, 24 by 7 support, and free access to GoDaddy hosting connection. The place to install over 30 free applications sure to help you get the most from your hosting plan and website. Plus, as a viewer of An In-Depth Look, enter the code Linux, that's L-I-N-U-X, when you check out and save an additional 10% on any order. Some restrictions apply. See site for details. Get your PC of the internet at GoDaddy.com.